So I suppose um, following on from what was a very comprehensive uh, outline there by Alistair, he's covered a lot of information that I now don't have to cover, thankfully. Um, I made in heart a uh, forensic science or forensic archaeologist in Ireland. And it must be said that there's only a handful of forensic archaeologists operating in Ireland. Um, most of whom work in regular archaeology and from time to time uh, step into the role of forensic archaeologist. Uh, the difference between the two roles has been um, very well outlined by Alistair. So who does what in Ireland? Uh, firstly, there's two jurisdictions, Northern Ireland and the what was officially termed the Republic of Ireland, now officially termed Ireland. And the police force here is on Garda Um, There is considerable cooperation between the two police forces, as you can imagine, especially since um, 1999 and the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, in the south in Ireland, uh, our, we have the Forensic Science um, Service is called Forensic Science Ireland. Uh, this is the main forensic lab that the Gardaí use, um, supported by the Office of the State Pathologist, obviously for human remains. And traditionally, or let's say during the 90s and into this century, there was one forensic anthropologist who uh, supported the Office of the State Pathologist, who was called in regularly, Laureen Buckley. And importantly, she had vast experience in regular archaeology as a field archaeologist, um, as an osteoarchaeologist, and very quickly uh, learned the, I suppose, the parameters that she was working in within forensic science. So that is the broad background. Um, the guards themselves have different units. Um, scenes of crime units, regional search units. Scenes of crime units are full time dedicated to just that role, uh, supported by Technical Bureau. Technical Bureau are um, police with specific forensic skills such as fingerprinting and uh, ballistics. But more and more of those specialisms are moving towards Forensic Science Ireland. The the police themselves do carry out searches um, supported by different specialisms. In this one case, I just wanted to highlight, um, you've got the police investigating the discovery of skeletal remains of an infant. They call in an expert, and that expert in this instance is a forensic anthropologist. And this is something that, that happens quite frequently in Ireland, where you have buried remains investigated by a forensic anthropologist with or without having any archaeological experience. So I just highlighted within the article there the, the aspects where forensic archaeology would be important, um, particularly the interpretation of the circumstances in which those remains were found. And Alistair alluded to that. So I, I need not get into it. Um, the legislation in Ireland um, is, I suppose, quite similar in, in many ways to that of the UK. You have general criminal justice system legislation. We only have one such piece of legislation that refers to forensic evidence. And it's largely concerned with the collection of DNA uh, samples and trace evidence. When, in terms of human remains, the Coroner's Act is the keystone here. Um, it was amended very recently in 2019. And one of those amendments was that the coroner now has the um, right, I suppose, to call on the assistance from other experts um, into the manner of death and so on. But it's an important change. Uh, I'm going to discuss this a little bit further along, but it's the Institutional Burials Act, and it's important because it's the first um, time that 
forensic archaeology, as in forensic excavation, has been mentioned in legislation in Ireland. Uh, so here you can see, I'll just draw your attention to uh, the fact that it's talking about forensic excavation to be carried out by an appropriately qualified person. And that in the performance of those duties, they'd be in accordance with international standards and best practice. That's important because we don't have um, guidelines set out here in Ireland that would, uh, I suppose, comply with best practice. So we have to look to international standards. And finally, it's worth mentioning that we have National Monuments Acts, which treat the discovery of all uh, skeletal remains as archaeological objects, unless the coroner intervenes under the Coroner's Act. Uh, this has been updated just this year. It's making its way through Parliament and uh, will ask or require the coroner in each instance to respect archaeological remains. So archaeology, as it's developed in Ireland, is, I suppose, the catalyst for it becoming a very much accepted thing um, was the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains. These victims, as many of you will know, were victims largely of uh, paramilitaries, sorry, all of paramil from paramilitary executions in related to the troubles in Northern Ireland. The legislation itself is has a duality between Ireland and the UK um, and was enacted as part of Good Friday Agreement. Forensic archaeology has been a kind of key element to this in terms of searching for those remains since 2007, 2008. And there's been great input, I suppose, from the likes of Bradford University and more recently Queen's University Belfast. To that end, the 17 victims um, that are listed as disappeared within this legislation, 13 have now been recovered. Most of those recoveries were carried out in Ireland. It's a good example of cross-border or multi-jurisdictional cooperation. Um, and really, I suppose, framed our understanding of forensic archaeology in Ireland. It must be noted that um, there was an amnesty built into the legislation whereby prosecutions couldn't develop from any evidence gathered, and that the evidence uh, collected was purely for the coroner to identify th those remains. It's still to a forensic standard. Following on from that commission, um, uh, Mother and Baby Homes Commission of Investigation was set up in 2015. Mother and Baby Homes, uh, I hope, I hope you've all heard of them, um, were institutions in within the new Irish state from about 1922 onwards. They were largely run by religious congregations, and the purpose of them was to house expectant mothers um, who were unmarried. A, a, a position where the, their, their position was stigmatized through most of the 20th century. There was allegations um, that at these institutions, the infant mortality rates were quite high, or very high in some cases, and that the, there was improper practices taking place. So this was the background to this investigation. They also needed to establish fact through to a forensic standard that would be that would basically stand up in court. Um, and under their terms of reference, point four here, I just draw your attention to investigating post-mortem practices, but key here was burial arrangements. Um, forensic archaeologists looked at two such sites. Uh, one is this site that you see here, uh, Shanross Abbey in the Midlands. And here we found quite usual burial practices um, occurring where it's a cemetery, essentially. Rows of infant remains buried in quite shallow um, graves, but coffined. Um, no markers as such, but other than that, it was quite normal. The second site that 
that was looked at was the former mother and baby home in Tum, County Galway. So this is the west of Ireland. And here the claim was that infant remains were buried within a sewage tank. This structure that was found is a concrete capped, um, multi-chambered structure, I suppose. It sits within what was a 19th century sewage tank associated with a workhouse. So the setting isn't very appropriate. As you can see the, from the profile drawing there, there are 20 chambers. Um, they're about two meters in depth. Uh, they're quite narrow, hard, to, difficult to access. And as a burial arrangement, it seems quite unusual. Um, the, the, the fact that it was located within a, a sewage tank. Sorry, Rob. No, oh, okay. Um, the fact that it was located or positioned within a sewage tank uh, was where the controversy started, I suppose. It must be said, though, that its functioning as a sewage tank uh, may have ceased at that point. It, it was difficult to, to determine exactly. Um, just on that, I suppose, the excavations here were requested to address investigative questions, really specific questions. The work was carried out under warrant and it is only a test excavation. So as Alistair said, we were establishing fact. Were there burial remains there? Yes. Uh, what was the age range, the date range, and so on. So those um, results were met with widespread concerns over bur burial practices at mother and baby homes and other institutions. And that is what um, led to the Institutional Burials Act, um, which was uh, passed by Parliament last year. As, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first piece of legislation that has ever mentioned forensic excavation. But there's a couple of caveats that we need to, to put to that. It only applies in very specific circumstances. So it has to be applied where the land is associated with a former institution or on state lands. It can only be enacted if the burials are manif manifestly inappropriate. And how you arrive at that definition is defined by the following bullet points. The burials must be either uncoffined, um, buried in such a manner that didn't comply with burial regulations at the time, were buried in an undignified way, or are buried in a location that is repugnant to common decency. And you can see from that last point, this is speaking to um, the situation at the tomb, the former mother and baby home at tomb. The location is accepted as being repugnant to common decency. The legislation is not to be used if the excavation cannot be carried out without disturbing, disturbing appropriately buried human remains, or if the recovery of human remains from, from the land will be unsafe or unreasonably difficult. The last point about it being unreasonably difficult is I suppose, hard to define because lots of these things are difficult. At, at what point do they become unreasonably so? So in conclusion, I suppose, where are we now? And uh, this is just an, an article here speaking about the police digging for the bodies of babies in a garden. And like Alistair alluded to about the media commentary that goes on, the guards in this instance weren't digging alone. You can see from the first line of the article, a forensic archaeologist was involved. Um, so we are slowly establishing an, appre uh, an appreciation of the skills of forensic archaeologists in Ireland, um, particularly in those humanitarian investigations associated with commissions of investigation. 
if not always within the criminal justice system. But there is a growing recognition of the potential uh, evidence gathering capability of forensic archaeologists. I think we were seen as a silver bullet um, initially that we'd have an answer to in every case. Um, our job is not to provide our thoughts, but only the actual evidence that we can prove. So it's it's also only being applied in cases of human remains and those of you know buried contraband and so on uh, don't really uh, see forensic archaeology used that often. There's still no forensic archaeologist employed by any part of the state, whether the police or otherwise. Exhumations and other recoveries. Uh, they're still regularly conducted by professionals who have little or no archaeological experience. And this is problematic because they're missing, uh, I suppose, large parts of the potential evidence that could be gathered from, from these crime scenes. There's new legislation uh, which is highlighting the need for forensic archaeologists, more so the need for archaeologists to have forensic skills when working in Ireland. And this is only beginning to be addressed now, I think. Um, there's been an increase in uh, opportunities, let's say, for forensic archaeologists to work in Ireland. You can see from our legislation, we're still looking for guidelines, um, and CIFA provides the only forensic archaeological guidelines that are applicable. Although the Forensics, forensic Science Ireland members of MC and through MC the European Meeting of Forensic Archaeologists promises such standards coming through scenes of crime. So there is light at the end of the tunnel um, in those terms but also the Institute within Ireland, the Institute of Archaeologists of Ireland is now interested in, interested in developing standards further that might be a bit more specific to the legislation that operates within Ireland. So I hope that, that I haven't bored you too much, but I'd just like to thank Rob and Laura and everyone at CIFA. And also thanks to Neve McCullough, um, who had uh, input into this summary. And thanks everyone for listening.